Hi everybody, we are uh, live and welcome to our podcast aimed at the 40 plus brigade. Uh, we're talking all things investments and uh, pensions tonight. So you're in a safe space, it's a 40 plus brigade. Um, everyone else on the webinar will have played the air guitar at a school disco at some point and define a good night out as one when you're home in bed by midnight. Um, my guest today, to introduce them without further ado, we have Justin King, who's a chartered financial planner. Justin, give us a wave so we know who you Hi, are. Hi, everyone. <laughs> and Alistair McQueen, who is the head of savings and retirement at Aviva. Hi, Alistair. Hi, Holly. Hi, Justin. Now, guys, before we kick on, there are some polls we've got um, on the the right hand side of, of your screen. If you could uh, just complete those, it gives us a better sense of who we've got on the webinar, who we're talking to tonight. So kind of mixed bag in terms of ages, most people uh, 50 to 60, um, moderately confident, not very confident. That's why you're here, guys. So that's that's good to know. Thanks for giving us that that sense of who is in the room tonight. Um, just a few sort of housekeeping points from me. We will finish before seven o'clock, not least because Alistair's just finished dry January, so you're probably <laughs> gasping for a glass of wine by then. Um, guys, I haven't told you about this. I have my buzzer. That's my jargon buzzer, okay, because we're not going to do any jargon today. So if you hear the buzzer, let's rewind and, and, and get rid of the jargon. Um, Please keep your questions coming. The aim of this webinar is to answer your questions. It's very difficult for us to answer very detailed, specific questions, but please sort of put your questions up there and we'll do our best to tackle them as we go. Right, Justin, I'm going to kick off with you. The 40 plus brigade, we've seen sort of a lot of people in their 40s on this webinar, people in their 50s and 60s. That midlife financial health check, what are some of the headlines, Justin? What should people be thinking about? <clears throat> I think awareness is the biggest thing, you know, suddenly to go, ah, right. It's it, it's coming, isn't it? That retirement thing. <laughs> it's coming. It's round the corner. You know, how quick have, how quick have we somehow gone from 20 to 40? And then, you know, we're going from 40 to 60 in the same, you know, in the same. Well, I think time gets quicker, doesn't it? As we seem to get older. Um, <clears throat> so I really think you just got to get aware of what have I got? What have I what have I amassed so far? Is it a number of different employers I've worked for? Have I left some pensions and some things behind that I'm not actually sure where they're invested or, or what, what they're going to pr produce for me? The other thing I really, really try and impress on everyone is understand your state pension. What's it going to give you? How, what, what have, have you? What's your contribution record? How long have you got to work to get a full state pension? It's a significant underpin for everyone's retirement. Um, <clears throat> you know, kind of just over nine and a half thousand pounds each now uh, for a couple. You know, that's a significant amount of money that's going to come in. For most 40 year olds, I think they're going to be going at 68, something like that. But you can go and check. You can go and check on the. Um, uh, you go and check your state pension age. So what, what's my contribution history? And also what, what age will I get, uh, what, what I'm projected, of course, to get my, my state pension. I think that's really, really significant. And we can share the link to that. Um, it's on the government website where you can check that. And also, Justin, find out what age you can get your bus pass, which I was very interested to find out about. Um, Alistair, coming to you, um, at Aviva, you, you have an app, don't you, called Midlife um, MOT. Could you tell people a wee bit about that and perhaps give some sort of tips on what you think people need to start thinking about? Yeah, well, at Aviva, I mean, we help about 6 million people in the UK save for and live in retirement. And what we recognise that the fastest growing demographic that we serve are the people, what we call in midlife, between the ages of 40 and 60. And interestingly, every every three months, the government does a survey and asks people, how happy are you? How stressed are you? And this demographic, the, the midlife population, are always reporting themselves, sadly, to be the least happy and the most stressed. This is a population under significant pressure, quite often referred to as the sandwich generation, helping younger people uh, on the property ladder, for example, and quite often supporting elderly relatives. So so we wanted to support that population. So yes, we have a free app called the Midlife MOT app, and you can go onto the Aviva website or just search for Aviva Midlife MOT, and that'll give you some hints and tips 
about how to take control, not only just your finances, but your, your working life and, and your health and well-being. So free, free guidance there, have a look. But I think when it comes to this conversation, I would start by binning, I would say, three out-of-date mindsets when it comes to this conversation about planning for a retirement. The first one I'd bin is, is it just me? Am I the only one who doesn't understand this? Well, put your mind at rest. You're not. All the research that anybody does says most people feel lacking in conversation in this area. So, so you're amongst many if you're starting to ask questions now. You're amongst many. Secondly, for a long time, people have walked around with the mindset that a woman's retirement age would be 60 and a man's would be 65. Now, those state pension ages were set 70 years ago and are now retired themselves. There is no set retirement age for anybody. It's in our individual control, uh, but it's up to us to make those plans. And today's a great way to begin. And the third one I had been is somebody else will surely plan my retirement for me. That is a thing of the past. Maybe in the past we did have one job for life. That is very much a thing in the past. Increasingly, it's a up to us as individuals to take control of our own retirement planning and if you can embrace it now then you'll be in a much better place to have the retirement that you want so it's not just you retirement is under your control but nobody else is going to do it for you so use this session and other sources to to take control let's let's jump into that so we've talked about sort of planning for retirement and you've made the good point justin that people can go out and, and check their their state pension and also the age that they might be when they maybe get their state pension. Let's not get into that. So in terms of making personal provision, you know, what would you say to people? There was a sort of question coming from someone earlier saying, look, I've got diddly squat in pensions. I've got quite a bit of money in savings, but I haven't really kind of gone down the pensions path. So how can people start to think about pensions when it comes to personal pensions and setting up? So well, retirement planning obviously is a broad kind of broad church, I suppose, and pensions are one of the things that you can use to provide retirement income. But if you want to specifically look at pensions, um, they're, they're very tax advantaged. Um, and for most employees, they are going to be in receipt of um, uh, an employer's contribution. It's extra money, it's extra wages that you're getting. And often employers will sometimes match or even enhance the contribution for whatever you contribute. So you're getting tax relief on the savings going in and maybe more money from your employer. Just, well, sorry, can I just cut in and ask on that? Does that mean you think people who are getting a pension at work would always be better off paying into that workplace pension than setting something else up themselves? You know, this is where individual advice obviously comes in, but as a if you just were going to act on this, this is not advice, this is obviously just some guidance, but invariably, yes, it's going to be the idea that uh, that an employer scheme with an employer additional contribution going in is going to be uh, worse off than something you find um, available um, in, in, the, in, the, in the free market or coming onto the Boring Money website and seeing the list of providers, et cetera, I think is unlikely. That adi it's additional wages that you're getting, those additional contributions. There are often also kind of nuances around it and things that again, I don't want to get the buzzer here, but the salary sacrifice, <laughs> you know, where this is the point where I talk to your employer, do you offer salary sacrifice? Go and understand these things. We probably can't cover that today, but go and understand, ah, well, if I give up some extra money and that goes in, there may be some national insurance savings, there may be some additional contributions from your employer that could really enhance your pot. So, so and that will probably only be available in your employer's scheme rather than um, rather than something you arrange yourself. Obviously, there could also be self-employed people on our call today um, yeah. and people not in a in an employed scheme. But that's a, that's a you know. so for, for people who have a workplace pension, a good tip is just to sort of call up the HR manager, whoever looks after your pensions and just find out what, what the deal is there. Alistair, I'm just sort of um, keen that we don't assume that people understand tax relief, because we talk about tax relief all the time. Could you sort of spell it out, perhaps with some sort of pounds and pence examples of why 
when we talk about pensions, we sort of talk about tax relief as being a good thing. Just explain to people what yeah. the, is there. Exactly. Well, it is quite re commonly, many people have heard, heard the phrase, but they don't understand it. So let's try and explain what it is. And it's a hugely beneficial thing and it is unique to pensions. The government wants us to save for a retirement. It's good for us because we'll have a better life in retirement. And it's helpful for the state because it would mean less taxpayers money to help us in later life. And one of the reasons, one of the ways in which they motivate us to save is by giving us tax relief on pension savings. And it interestingly celebrated its 100th birthday last year. Pensions tax relief has been around for 100 years. It can sound complicated, but I'd summarize it as, as free money, a lot of free money. The government gives in the region of 40 billion pounds of tax relief every year to help us save in pensions. So a lot of money, free money, what is it? Let's explain, I'll try and keep it simple. Any money that we receive in income, we will typically pay income tax on that. And I'm gonna use some general figures here. Tax rates are different in Scotland and other parts of the country, but generally, let's say, if you earn a hundred pounds, you'll pay about 20 pounds of tax on that if you're a basic rate taxpayer. So you'll get 80 pounds in your pocket. A higher rate taxpayer, you'll pay 40 pounds on that 100 pounds of income, 45 pounds if you're an additional taxpayer. So the amount of money you get in your pocket reduces because of that tax. However, if you choose to put that income into a pension to incentivize you, the government says, I'm not going to take that tax off that money. That 100 pounds, I'm not going to take any tax off and it's going to go straight into your pension. So there's none of that tax take off of your pension saving. That is the tax relief. And so in very simple terms, if you save £100 each month for 40 years, £100 each month for 40 years, and you're a basic rate taxpayer, you'll receive a boost of £20 every month, £240 every year, or nearly £10,000 boost over those 40 years. In very simple terms, you would not get that money in any other way. So that's free money that the government's giving you in the way in to incentivize you to save. You'll also pay no tax as the pension is growing, as you may do in other investments, another tax boost. And when it comes to taking money out, the government lets you take up to a quarter of those savings without paying tax on a quarter of those savings. Now, these are unique tax advantages that the government gives you to incentivize us, to encourage us to save in pensions that you would really, really struggle to get anywhere else. Now, finally, I'd have to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. Now, the price that we may pay for benefiting from all of those tax advantages is we can't get our hands on our pensions money until we're at least 55. It's designed for a retirement, so it's not a short-term savings vehicle. So there's that catch, clearly. And there's also a limit to how much uh, money we can put in every year. The government has to put a ceiling on how much money it's willing to give away. Now, for most people, this is irrelevant, but just for the record, most of us can't save more than £40,000 in any one year into a pension or about £1 million over a whole lifetime. So yes, there are some catches, but for the vast majority of people, these tax benefits that they give us when we put money in during the life of our pension and when we take our money out, it's very <clears> hard to match those elsewhere and will we'll be put us in a great place when it comes to saving for retirement. Thanks, thanks, Alistair. So, yeah, I mean, I sort of think the summary is free money, sort of, in a pension, um, in a SIP, it doesn't get, and people asking on a SIP, that's a self-invested personal pension. Um, I guess the plus is, Justin, of an ISA is flexibility, isn't it? That if you save into an ISA, you can take that money out um, at a time of your choosing. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, the flexibility, I think, is is key. And you can mix and match with everything. I mean, you could even, if we, it, sometimes, especially if you think about the people we're talking, talking with today, in their maybe 20s and 30s, a lot of people may have been a basic rate taxpayer. And as Alison beautifully put about receiving basic rate tax, and as our careers progress, we might move up into the higher rates of tax um, later on in life. Well, maybe that's the point, of course, that you can pull, pull in the ISA savings and, and start popping it into the pension to, 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 to move up to that £40,000 contribution limit that uh, Alistair mentioned, that, that then you could, you know, enhance your savings and enhance the tax reliefs. So, so there are lots of ways that you can plan if you 
have an idea of maybe how your earnings will move forward through your career. Okay, thank you. A question from Lucy that's just come in, can you have a work pay pension and a SIP? I, I know you can, unless I'm doing something horribly wrong, Lucy, because I do. We happen to use um, Aviva in my company for the workplace pension, and then I have, um, well, I have a number of SIPs actually for test purposes for our research, but I pay into um, a personal pension as well. And like Justin sort of has just been talking about ISAs, I always have an ISA because I don't want to lock everything away um, and, until later in life. So you can have, as Justin said, it's not an either or conversation um, at all. Question about people want to know the sort of state pension age, the sort of debate going on. Alistair, I know it sort of changes depending, but if someone's listening, for example, and they're 50 today, am I putting you on the spot here? What What is, um, when are they going to get their state pension do we think as it stands today? Well, that's one that's pretty close to my heart because that's roughly where I am at at the moment. And so you know, I am putting, it's going to be roughly 67, I think, um, cre creeping up towards 68 for that person who's that age. But rather than me guessing the numbers, as I sit here now, the government recognized that these ages are rising and therefore they have built a very good and very simple free tool called the state pension forecast go on to google state pension forecast it'll ask you your date of birth and it'll tell you straight away exactly to years and months exactly when you'll get your state pension now just quickly just to pause on yes the, the government are planning to increase the state pension age it is planning to rise from it's currently 66 up to towards 68 and in, indeed in this year they're going to have another look at it and see should it rise further and should it rise faster the debate is out there but let's just remember when the state pension was introduced um, back in 1908, believe it or not, it was introduced back then with a state pension age of 70, when most people had a life expectancy of maybe 65. So it was a very, very rare thing that people were even getting this state pension. And it's since moved up. And so really, it's something of a celebration of our increasing life expectancy. Um, the chances of our living to 100 are increasing all the time. And to try and keep pace with that, the government is saying, of all political colours, I'd have to say, are saying we should look at the state pension age. Yes, it's fine to potentially consider raising it. What we all must do and what the government must do is communicate it. Um, there's been some examples of poor communication of changing the state pension age. That doesn't help anybody. So yes, now if the government or any political colour are saying we should change the state pension age, I think they're recognising that they must communicate it. And finally, to put some people's mind at rest, one commitment the government have given is that if you're within 10 years of your state pension age, they're not going to accelerate it for that cohort. So it's not like it's going to change overnight and suddenly you're going to find it away in the distance. Within 10 years, you should be able to plan with significant confidence as to what your state pension age is. Beyond 10 years, so 56 and younger, it may move out. But for 56 and over, you should know with confidence that that is going to be your state pension age. With confidence, because that's what the government have promised us. We'll move on from that. <laughs> Justin, one question I know lots of people have is they sort of sit there and they go, when can I retire? Like, what, how old do I have to be? And people sort of Google it. Now, you know, you're going to tell us, aren't you? It's sort of horses for courses and depends what you want. How can people sort of start to, to think about this and that question? How much do I need? Justin, tell me, how much do I need to retire? <laughs> well, of course. How, how can people start to sort of, you know, think through these, these things and start to sort of sketch out their plan? Yeah, well, we have to we have to um, ask ask ourselves some questions about well, what do we expect to be spending? Do we hope? You know, one of the reasons I always think about paying off a mortgage is really significant. Of course, is that we can then live rent free in our retirement. Um, you know, that's the real purpose. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, you, the, the, therefore, so at what point is our, ex what's our expenditure likely to be and therefore what lifestyle we would. And uh, retired sp spending is different. You know, um, people aren't commuting so much, but maybe they're holidaying more. Um, so it's trying to understand what that looks like to you. What does that, what does an ideal retirement look like? And then is there a way Oh, what, what is it that I'm desperate to get out of the work that I currently do? Or is there a way that I can find work that actually 
fulfills me for longer. Maybe there's part time work that I still can supplement my income by. So it's just really just kind of sitting down and going, OK, so what if I could if I could really design my ideal retirement, what would that look like? First of all, what age? And second of all, where would I be living and what would I be doing? How would I be spending my time? And in answer to some of those questions, we can then get some numbers of what you're going to be spending. And then, of course, we then need to turn that into an amount of capital. But of course, we can deduct, hopefully, a, a state pension or any other pension or, or any savings that you've already made. OK, Alistair, you were going to um, talk to us, I think, with some numbers, aren't there? Because I think it's quite, if you sort of sat down and said to me, Justin, right, how much are you going to spend in retirement? I'd, I don't know, I'd, I'd be a bit gobsmacked. I, mean, I wouldn't really know what the answer was. So, Alistair, someone's done some thinking, haven't they? I, I know it's not exactly what I want to spend. No, I agree. I, yeah, I mean, I think it is the understandable question. With all the details, just tell me how much do I need? And, and an organization called the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association, the PLSA, have attempted to respond to that. Now, clearly, there is validity in saying the answer to that question is it depends. If you want to live your retirement like a billionaire, you're going to need a heck of a lot of money. But most of us are not aspiring to be billionaires in retirement. So what they've done is they've tried to look at the average individual how much would an average individual need to fund a retirement and i will just position it but i really encourage the people who are watching and listening to go and look at the plsa retirement living standards plsa retirement living standards you'll find it all very well presented there but what they've done is they've tried to calculate how much would the average individual need to live a minimum quality of life in retirement or a moderate the middle ground, moderate in retirement, or a comfortable life in retirement to try and give you some indication as to how much money you may mean you may need. And they've presented that as a single individual or as a couple. And just to present to you the numbers very simply, so for a single individual on that minimum level of income, they would want about 10,900, 11,000 pounds a year. A single individual in that moderate 21, it's 20,800, quite precise, 21,000 pounds a year, or to reach that comfortable level, they're suggesting around about 33,000 pounds every year. So they're trying to give some information for us. Now, clearly, none of us are average. Some of us may want more, some of us may want less, but they're saying for that average single person between 11,000 for the minimum quality of life and £33,000 a year for that comfortable quality of life. And they also present figures for a couple. So we're starting to get an idea of the area that we want to get yeah. towards. And then, and then we can start building on it. And the first building block, I think, that Justin mentioned up at the beginning was, let's say I want that minimum quality of life. I'm a single individual. I want that minimum quality of life. I need £11,000 a year to achieve that. Now, let's remember that the state pension, which most of us should be entitled to, is going to give us towards nine and a half thousand pounds a year. So we're already getting quite close to that minimum level for most people. How do I bridge the gap from that state yeah. pension up to that 11,000? And you can then start building out from there. So to get an idea, to get that framework, have a look at the Pensions and Lifetime Savings Association Retirement Living Standards. And you can then start to see what 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 you may want to do, what you want to save towards. And people are asking about the links. We will send out links to everything we, we reference in the webinar tonight. Um, I might have to do some adjustment to those because I did note the clothing and footwear allowance didn't seem very generous to me. <laughs> I need to look at that. Now, Justin, help us to think about, will you talk through something called the 4% rule? I know not everyone sort of likes it, but I think the next step is Alistair says, right, once we sort of worked out what we might need for a retirement, that then goes to the question, well, how much do I need to amass? How much do I need to accumulate in order to afford that? So what is a rule of thumb? How can people start to sort of calculate? Well, that's fine. If I want to get that sort of standard of living, that might be 30 grand a year, whatever. How do I save up for that? How much do I need? Yeah. So uh, before I get to the actual number, yeah. or, I think there's a couple of things that we could, a couple of things that people can do to really enhance their number. So we, we, Alistair 
kindly explained how advantaged these tax relief pensions are. But then we've got, if we think of, if, if, if you're single, then you, you've got a personal allowance and you're allowed to receive in, you know, when, once you're not, well, whilst you're working or not working, you can still receive some tax-free money. In, in Pensions are treated as pay. So when you start taking them, they're still taxed under the PAYE system. So in a, they're, they're, but they're just having tax taken off. They're not having national insurance taken off. But you've got, currently, we've got a, a personal allowance today, £12,570. If you add the tax-free cash element to that 12570 the 25% that we were speaking about before, that actually allows you £16,760 received tax-free. Well, that's pretty significant. And of course, if you've got a, if you've got a couple, that's £32,000 worth of tax-free income that you can receive in retirement. Well, so when we start looking at trying to get this capital sum that we're all after, if you are in a partnership, you're a civil partner, or, or you're both, or a couple, or cap, you're both trying to plan for your retirement in the future, think about the independent taxation. Think about actually trying to have an equal amount that you're both saving into pensions. Um, because of course, when it comes back out, you want it to be the most tax effective. What you don't want is it all lumped into one one person's um, income, and they're there getting 40%, 45% tax on their pension income. So just have a little think about that, because the, the tax tail when it comes back out is really quite significant. Coming back to the 4% rule, which of course is what you asked for, if we were thinking about, um, let's say we've got... Uh, uh, the, the, I think what the couple wanted 50,000. The most comfortable retirement planning we can have was 50, about 50,000 pounds a year. And if we, if we assume that both of the couples are going to get uh, 10,000 pounds a year in state pensions, we can take off 20,000 pounds. So, so we've got a need now of 30,000 pounds. So if we take 30,000 pounds and we multiply that by 25 and we draw down at 4%, which is our four percent uh, rule. Hang on, rewind. <laughs> rewind on, on the maths there. Why by twenty five? Well, twenty five is a multiple of the four percent in essence to get to, to get us to our capital lump sum amount. This Could is this that, this four percent rule has really come about through lots of back testing of investment portfolios over the last century really of what an investment portfolio could continue to produce in returns if you drew down on it now if you drew down 100 percent in the first year we kind of know that you're only going to have one year's worth of income so how much can if we've got let's say a hundred thousand pounds saved in a pension pot how much can we take out each year i always try and explain it to my clients of Let's just pretend this pension is, 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 is the hole in the wall. And when you go to your local bank and take out £100, there's also another one next to it called pension. And you put your pension card in there and you put your pin in and out it comes and, and you're withdrawing from that pension pot. Well, how much are you allowed or how much can you take each month, each week from that pension pot for it not to run out over the course of your lifetime? If we look at some statistics and i think we might touch on this later an average couple retiring at i don't know 65 at the moment one of them has a chance of, of what there's a 50 percent chance one of them will live to about 92 93. so one person will still be alive into their 90s so retirement now is a 30-year period so what we're trying to make sure here is we've got enough money when you go to that hole in the wall for 30 years, there's enough in there. And back testing all the data that we've got, there's no guarantees for the future, but back testing all the data, it seems to suggest that a taking 4% of your money out, £100,000 will take £4,000 out a year, that your capital will still survive for a 30-year retirement. Thank you. Thank you for explaining that. I think, as you say, it's a rule of thumb, but it's sort of helpful for people. I start to think to sort of start to get, okay, if I had um, a hundred thousand pounds in a personal pension, for example, you know, how much 
could I take out of that every year? And then as Alistair was saying, add that to what the state pension forecast is, and you're starting to get a sort of feel of what that might be. We're gonna cut some questions now, guys. If we can sort of make like, um, we're on a game show as much as we can, short answers if possible. We had loads of questions that came in before the, the webinar. They are difficult questions, but let's go for brevity. Um, Justin, does it make sense to take the 25% tax-free from the pension at the point of retiring or to leave it invested? You know, it's, this is something that I model quite often. And the only question I would have back is, have you got debt? If you've got a mortgage still outstanding that you're, you're supporting, it's often worthwhile maybe clearing that debt because with, with the tax-free cash. If you haven't, I'd prefer to take that tax-free cash a little bit each year to supplement the rest of your income? That was an amazingly quick answer. Well done. I wish I had a sort of clapping thing here. Right, um, Alistair, we haven't really talked about um, self-employed pensions. Now, there's someone who said, is there any incentive tools or any sites I can use to convince my partner who is self-employed and 49 that it's not too late to start a pension? Yeah, well, I would start by saying to anybody, it's never too late. At 49, I think their life expectancy is 85. I think they've got approaching a 1 in 10, 1 in 15 chance of living to 100. So there's a lot of years in the future that they wish to and they would need to fund. So it's never too late. I'd also say that the self-employed is a population that to some extent has been left behind when it comes to retirement planning. Um, every employer in this country must now give their staff access to a workplace pension and that's about 30 million people. There's approaching 5 million people in this country who are self-employed who don't have that same support network around them and the government recognise this but haven't yet come up with an answer to this. So at the moment, like so many things for self-employed people, the retirement planning is down to themselves. The great news is that there's a huge range of individual organizations, clearly Aviva would be one, who are there able to provide pension products for those individuals and you can do it directly yourself. If you go into any known financial services organization such as Aviva and type in Aviva pension, you'd see the products that we have and that will explain to you how to get started. And also just approach it with an element of don't be too scared. You can dip your toe in the water. There's, there's not, there's, there'll be a threshold that you can start saving at. You can start saving, stop saving, increase, decrease. The control is in your hands. So approach these free online web services, have a look at see what's available, start to explore. It's never too late and recognize that you have many, many years ahead of you that you want to save for now so that you can thrive not just survive when eventually you get to retirement but it can't be walked past that for the self-employed people the five million or so out there the responsibility is still primarily on their shoulders to take control of their own retirement Holly, yeah. Holly can i just jump in on here there's a yeah. little tax tip that i think would be really useful for people so if you've got a situation where the 49 year old doesn't have any pension planning but the other partner or spouse does think about am i better off contribute the person who has got a pension who may be an employee am i better off stopping paying into that and actually contributing to my partner's uh, uh, self-employed pension because of the independent taxation uh, which when it comes back out which will provide the greatest return if they so because they go the if the, the 49 year old with no pension provision is probably not going to amass a huge pension over the, the his course or her course of lifestyle it may be better contributing to hers one planning aspect i've done before is i've taken the tax-free cash at 55 from one person's pension and we've rolled it into the other person's pension I mean, you can't, you've got to take it out, you've got to pay, you've got to have tax-free cash, but then contribute it to the, to the spouses because they can then in have an enhanced pension themselves when they take it out. They're both basic rate taxpayers, you know. And that's, that's a great tip. And I think if people are listening to this, starting to go, oh my God, this is getting quite complicated. You know, I think if we're talking about saving into ISAs or perhaps if we're in our 40s, sort of saving into a DIY pension, that's something I think I feel quite confident doing myself. There's a few questions come in about when is it worth seeing a financial advisor. You know, for me at the point of retirement, there's so much that, that we either don't know about or could get wrong. 
you don't have to see a financial advisor anymore for life, do you, sort of, Justin? I mean, people can phone someone up and say, but this is me, can I come in and get a one-off kind of structure or a plan or piece of advice? So I think when I hear you say things like that to me, I'm like, okay, that is, you really could save quite a lot of money in tax by, by getting some advice. So there you go, a plug for, for advisors, because um, it's so bloody complicated. <laughs> <laughs> um, and sort of questions coming in, let's think, and, and of course, sort of for the, the, the self-employed, and we have a, a Best Buy section on our website, we review all the DIY pensions out there. I think it's worth sort of saying to people, you know, you can open these pensions up and put very simple sort of ready-made solutions in them. So there's lots of help out there. You don't have to feel that by opening up one of these DIY pensions, you have to be a super expert and, and know what to pick and blend in there. It's, it's easier than it's ever been before. And also lots of places let you get going with 50 quid a month. So it, it really is um, easier than ever. Um, talking about the sort of what goes into pensions, guys, we're, we're getting some sort of questions from people, um, you know, given current volatility, is this the time to move a small £30,000 investment saving into cash and wait for the upturn? Justin, should we wait for the upturn? <laughs> um, okay, let's, let's, look at, let's look at a little bit of data here. When we're investing, ideally we are investing in well-run companies of the world whose purpose is to make profits and return those profits in dividends to, and growth of that company to their shareholders. You are one of those shareholders when you're investing in those pension funds. You've got, as Alice has said, you know, 50 odd, you've got 35 years ahead of you. The timing of something, uh, whether one week or the next week, is kind of irrelevant. It's a, it's a sideshow. Get invested. Thirty-five years of growth ahead of you. I'm, I'm, I'm betting. I'm betting on the well-run companies of the world to continue to produce profits and returns to you over that period of time. Uh, it's a, one week or two weeks. Uh, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even. Yeah, I wouldn't even have that thought process. I just get invested. Okay. And I just, I just jump. I totally agree with everything Justin's just said. I think if the individual, for whatever reason, does wish to put their thirty thousand pounds into cash, let's say they need it next week, you wouldn't necessarily throw it into the investment markets if you needed it next week. But I would still encourage that individual to shop around with their cash savings. Every month, the Bank of England publishes figures, an incredible two hundred and fifty billion pounds of our cash savings, household cash savings is sitting in deposit accounts that pays zero interest. Now, that is wasting money. That might as well be burning money every month. Um, now, shop around, have a look at various websites, try and work out a better return on your cash savings if you've decided that cash savings is the way to go. But if you're looking over the longer term for everything that Justin's just said, the investment markets offer you a, a strong probability of generating a better return over that longer term. Mm. Someone's just come on with a point which is interesting. The danger is when it's time to get your pension um, and, and the stock market is bad. That's my biggest worry. It happened to my dad during the financial crisis. Justin, what would you say to that? So one of the things we do for our clients is that we model and we, I, I, I'm quite cautious. I like five years worth of cash need to be held inside my pension or, or alternative, maybe in ISAs or just in the bank account. So I'll sit with the client and I'll say, okay, let's have a look at your expenditure. Let's say just very simply, it was 20,000 pounds a year. I know they've got 10,000 pounds a year coming in from their state pension. We've got a need for 10,000 and let's say there's I don't know, £200,000 in their pension pot and they're 65. And I'd say, okay, let's move, let's, we've got a, let's move five years worth of, of, of 50, in essence, £50,000 into very cautious assets within the pension fund. Could be fixed income securities, it could be really cautious, it could be cash. And I know then that stock market volatility is not going to affect that £50,000. That allows me with the £200,000 I've got left over, to be fully invested in, in the global well-run companies of the world to get growth for five years plus. And historically, again, it's all historic, it's all history, but historically, 
five years has been a good period for, for to be obtained growth in the stock market. And then you've got the surety with the next five years, I can, I can afford to take out £10,000 a year from my pension pot because it's going to be unaffected, unaffected by market volatility. Thank and you. I just I'd, I'd build it that that's all great. And then for all, for the, in the last ten years, about ten million people have been what's been called automatically enrolled into workplace pensions. So this has been the big quiet revolution in the pensions market from employers. Ten million people. One of the rules of that industry in that game is anyone who's investing in what they call the default fund, the core fund, it must move customers' money from a higher risk investment world to a slightly lower risk investment world as they approach retirement um, to avoid these last minute shocks that you may have on the cusp of your retirement age. So if somebody watching or listening has been automatically enrolled, they should walk with have, have the confidence that this is being thought about by them, by their employer. And if you're unsure, speak to your employer, ask them what, what is being done in my fund as I approach retirement? And they should give you reassurance that there are steps being taken to move your investments from this risky environment to a less risky environment so that you're not uh, vulnerable to big shocks just as you're seeking to take your cash. But but I have a real problem with those funds, of course, because is they're not bespoke to the individual. And actually, if you are 60 and you've got 30 years ahead of you, you should not be in some default cautious fund. Some of the money should be for the amount that you're going to take out and the rest of it should be still invested in the things that has always worked, companies of the world producing profits and that's where you get the return. So I think the real key thing here is, is, is I, w I really want to impress people to pay attention to what their provider is doing. And then if it's too much, go and get some advice, but, but, but there's, a, there's a lot of knowledge out there the Boring Money website, you know, there's a lot of information that you can upskill yourself here to, to really get a greater, better outcome. Thank you, Justin. And I should say, by the way, there's some love coming in for your camera and, and the quality of your camera. Maybe um, in the, the notes we send out after the webinar, we can tell people where you get your kit. Um, but there was a question that came in, you know, do you suggest sticking with the default fund or going for higher returns by choosing a more adventurous strategy? It's interesting, isn't it? Because the, ch the, the world's changed and, and rules of thumb have changed. I mean, I remember when I first started out in investing, there were all these rules of thumb about, oh, when you when you become 60 and you're old, go into bonds and don't have any, you know, and then that's sort of crazy, as you're saying, if people are likely to live um, for another 30 years, it's really important to have that mix of some cash for when you need it, um, but some assets working harder too. Um, question come in, how to invest your first £50,000 for retirement? I'm feeling stuck and would like simple suggestions. Um, what I would say to that is I think, Justin, I don't know, why, why do I think you might frown at this? I think multi-asset funds are people's friends so so um do research those we've got a section on our site i think of them like ready meals um with investment products in them where you don't have to be an expert you don't have to do the cooking you don't have to blend it i mean it's a really nice gentle way to start justin would what would you say to someone that said right i've got fifty thousand pounds i want to save for retirement i don't know quite what i'm doing and i can't afford to come and see justin king just yet yeah, and you don't need to, you know, the hours spent with me to go through all the compliance regulations, etc, to take on a client, you know, you spend that time just spending a few hours learning about investing. Um, look at there's a there's a gentleman who died a few years ago, um, Jack Bogle from Va who is set up Vanguard, read some of his books, and he will tell you about successful investing. Um, and and that just that money and time spent doing that will pay such dividends, and you'll see why I'm just a great fan of investing in great companies of the world over your whole. Remember, your retirement is not a one-off event. It's a you're going to that hole in the wall, marked pension, week after week after week after week. It's a 30-year period, hopefully, um, and therefore you can afford to be invested. Uh, people say adventurously, I just don't believe it's adventurous. Look at the stats and just go, there's volatility in the market, absolutely. And that's why you have that cash buffer. But once you've got that cash buffer, the greatest success you will have is your own behavior. 
I thought I thought it was an interesting word that was put in that question. The individual said they were feeling stuck. I would just want to emphasize that when you do invest in a pension, for example, you are not stuck in the mold in which you entered it on day one. You are in total control about where you put your money. If you want to put in more or you want to reduce the amount you're putting in, you are in control. So don't feel it's a one and done stuck for the rest of your life decision. And in my organization, we recognize that many people do not feel confident. So we, yes, for the more adventurous and confident individual, we present them with 2000 different investment funds from which they can choose. Or for the individual who is maybe feeling overwhelmed, we say, well, here are three funds from which you can start a low risk, a medium risk and a higher risk. Start with one of them and then you can move towards one of the other 2000 funds. So the control, one of the things that my industry has learned is we need to give more control and empowerment to the individual. We can't throw all of that responsibility onto the individual and then walk away. We're the good organizations. You can judge who the good ones are yourself are trying to help people take control of that responsibility recognizing that some love the choice some are paralyzed by the choice and good organizations present options for both populations yeah, thank you here's a question coming in i'm slightly loath to take it because we haven't got three hours ahead of us quick answers please on equity release and now people using equity release well justin what do you say when people come to you and ask about equity release I think, you know, I think, I think it's going to be huge. I mean, at the moment it's, it's not, we don't see a lot of people for it. Maybe that's just the type of clients that we serve, but um, I think it is enormous. I think, uh, I think the rates are getting much more competitive. The products are much better. Um, I, I think it needs to be done. It's got to be done at the right time. Um, but if, with a proper plan, and you can say, OK, well, I'm going to burn through my pension fund in the first 10 years and then I'm going to equity release. You know, it, it, let's have a look at this. But this should be this is a significant asset within um, the population of the UK. I think it, I think it should be it should be on the table. OK, thank you very much. Um, questions coming up. Can someone remind me where the speakers are from? Justin King from Aviva. No, no. Justin King is the certified financial planner or chartered financial planner forgive me Alistair, <laughs> <laughs> Alistair McQueen is um, head of savings and retirement um, from Aviva we're just sort of coming up to time there were a few questions earlier Alistair very quickly people who want to check national insurance contributions or are sort of questions coming in about people who have taken some years out or something how can people check national insurance contributions well I think yep we mentioned before the state pension forecast go on to go to google or go to the gov.uk website ultimately and ask for your state pension forecast and that will present back to you based on your current national insurance record what your predicted state pension will be and at what age and then it'll identify if you have a shortfall in national insurance contributions, you could potentially make up some of that gap. It's a, it, the, For most people in retirement, the state pension still represents their foundation income for most people in retirement. So it's really important that you do understand how much you may be entitled to and from what age and make sure that you have made those national insurance contributions. The gov. It's a government provided service, the gov.uk state pension forecast should provide, provide you with information in the right direction. Oh, brilliant. Some people have just shared the link, but again, we'll send links um, out with this podcast. Podcast? Hello, wake up, Holly. <laughs> this webinar. Question about how do I move my pension funds to those I am assured that are ethical and sustainable? This is a tricky question to get that sort of sense of um, assurance. Um, we will send out in the, the links to this, there are some robo-advisors that have um, sustainable or ethical options and more of the DIY pensions that we've talked about um, from various groups out there will have short lists in the fund research sections which will direct you um, to various sustainable and ethical funds, trying to sort of unpick how sustainable and ethical they are remains um, sort of work in progress from, from the industry, I think. But we have some info on that um, we can send out. I guess, guys, just sort of in the sort of closing few minutes, if we sort of take a step back and summarise some of the key points. Justin, um, 
you know, thinking for people on the webinar, the majority of people sort of in their 50s, um, key takeouts or sort of tips from you to those people who are starting to think about making some sensible steps towards planning that retirement? You know, I think we can sometimes get overawed by this kind of big capital sum that we're told that we need to save. And I always try and put it in a slightly different way and think, you know, if I if I put a hundred pounds away in that bank account marked pension, um, that means I've got a hundred pounds later in my life to enjoy. And hopefully, because I've invested it wisely, it will it'll have gone up by at least inflation. And therefore I can spend it when I take it to Sainsbury's, I, I can take it I can take it there and, and, and buy my goods that week. So just anything that we put away is is going to enhance our retirement life think about the retirement that you'd like think about maybe the maybe still fulfilling work for you to continue to do um uh, you know i work with a lot of retirees and and the, the people i find the happiest or so often the happiest they're still involved in something they're still part of something and that may be community that may be charity if they can afford to do so but often it's it, it they are got they've they've got jobs still uh, whether that's self-employed or as a consultant or you know the classic uh, chap at B and Q. You know, but they're part, they're enjoying part of something, and I think that you can substantiate your retirement income hopefully during that period of time and and still be part of life. So just think about your retirement. Think about it's hard to put that number on it, but everything that you can save and understanding this tax system really, really will pay you huge benefits. Yeah, I think so. Um I'm going to the very granular. There was a question earlier about being self-employed or working part-time. That was the question, actually. Can I work part-time and still pay into a pension? Yes. Yes. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> the contributions you can make are they are they any less? I think I think working part-time. I think you're in control. Um, the employer there's a there's a legal minimum income above which the employer must enroll you into their workplace pension um, if you're working part-time you may not meet that threshold so the employer may not be legally required to enroll you into that pension so speak to your employer and understand are they doing that or not if they are not then the responsibility the empowerment sits with you and you could go to as you say holly one of these diy pension organizations aviva or whoever and say i'd like to start my own pension but um you're empowered to do it if you wish to do it thank you and alistair just sort of some closing comments from you i guess on what people in their sort of 40s 50s top tips for people to sort of go away and think about i think first of all i'd say by engaging in the boring money event like tonight you're taking the first step to take control and i think well done for doing that that's a really big first step in the right direction as justin said up front understand your state pension it's going to be the foundation for most people get your state pension forecast and then secondly i'll just put a shout out on the aviva website we've got a free tool we call the retirement planner go on there it'll ask you some basic questions and it will give you a forecast as to how much your entire pension savings including your state pension could potentially give you by the time you reach retirement and you can play about on there and say if i saved a little bit more or if i worked a little bit longer what impact would that have so take control of your state pension get your state pension forecast maybe have a look at aviva's retirement planner and then you're in a much better place to to plan for the retirement that you want don't leave this until you're 65 and 11 months ask the question now like many people have been doing on tonight's broadcast thank you guys and i guess an observation from me as well is i think it's easier than ever to set up a diy pension um online there are as alistair said earlier you know i think on the aviva platform i'm right in saying alistair you can either pick your own from thousands of funds or there are three sort of simple ready-made yeah. options where you don't have to be an expert to get um, going. A couple of sort of bits from me, there's some polls at the end, um, which um, Aviva would like your opinion on three questions there. So if people could uh, fill those out, that would be great. I hope you have enjoyed um, this podcast. If you have, it's... <laughs> that is 
Somebody oh, has. <laughs> Tell the kids not to come home before seven o'clock, and they're, they're fi- they must be hungry. They're five minutes early, so the dog's gone off. Sorry, everyone. As I was saying, if you've enjoyed the podcast, please leave us a review on Trustpilot. It's always um, very helpful. We will be sending an email out with links to some of the sites and the things we've discussed um, tonight. Justin has a podcast called The Retirement Cafe um, and some content on YouTube, which I'm sure is really helpful. And the Aviva uh, retirement section of their website is jam packed with lots of articles, calculators, tools, tips, etc. There you go. Five minutes earlier, Alistair, so you can um, <laughs> thank you. First glass of wine for the year. Um, I am going to go before all hell breaks uh, <laughs> loose, but thank you so much to Justin and King and Alistair McQueen for joining us and to Thanks, all Holly. of you for listening. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Good night. Good night.